All right, um, good morning. Uh, also, good evening to our speakers as well as audience in Seoul. My name is Jisoo Kim, Director of the GW Institute for Korean Studies and Korea Foundation Associate Professor of History, International Affairs, and East Asian Lang Languages and Literatures. I would like to first welcome and thank our speakers, discussants, and audience for joining our event today. Um, today's event is co-sponsored by the GW Institute for Korean Studies and Jeju Peace Institute in South Korea. I would like to thank Director Intek Han and his staff members for helping to organize today's event. Um, back in April, GWICS organized its first COVID-19 virtual event on South Korea's response to the coronavirus. At this event, the speakers were government officials and field experts, and they discussed how South Korea responded to the coronavirus during the initial stage. Today, um, our event is focused on the issue of reopening and how South Korea is dealing with its challenges. We think that this is very timely discussion for our audience here, especially in the U.S., as we are trying to move to phase two of reopening next week here in Washington, D.C. At our last event, it was the field experts who discussed about South Korea's response to the coronavirus. This time, we wanted to hear from journalists about reopening issues so that we can approach the issue of coronavirus from diverse angles and offer fresh perspectives that are different from field experts. Now I'll move on to introduce our speakers and discussants. We're very delighted to have them with us today. Starting with Sarah Kim, she is a reporter on the National Desk of the Korea, Korea Chunang Daily, published with the New York Times International Edition. She specializes in foreign affairs and security issues, but also has covered health, education, and social affairs. She is the recipient of the 2019 Foreign Language Newspapers Association of Korea, Award for Journalists. Um, next speaker is Victoria Kim, who is a sole correspondent for the Los Angeles Times. She, since joining the paper in 2007, she has covered, covered state and federal courts, worked on investigative pro projects, and reported on Southern California's Korean community. She has previously written for the Associated Press out of South Korea and West Africa, as well as for the Financial Times in New York. Um, for our discussants, we have Sung-Ming Kim, who is a White House reporter for the Washington Post covering the Trump administration. And before joining the Washington Post in 2018, she spent more than eight years at Politico, primarily covering the Senate and immigration policy. She is also an on-air political analyst for CNN. Finally, but not least, Tim Martin is the Korea Bureau Chief for the Wall Street Journal, where he oversees news coverage on the Korean Peninsula. He has been based in Seoul since early 2017 with prior stints at the journal's office in New York, Chicago, and Atlanta, where he covered public health and the CDC. Now, uh, briefly about the format, um, each presenter will have 10 minutes. We will then ask our discussants for their first round of comments and questions. Each discussant will have five minutes. We will then ask the presenters to respond. Then the two presenters will have about 15 minutes in total, so about seven to eight minutes each. We will then have the second round of comments and questions from the discussants, again, five minutes each, and back to the presenters to uh, respond, and they'll have another 15 minutes in total. Uh, we'll then open for Q&A for our general audience. So for our general audience, please use our uh, chatting box to address your questions. I'll be collecting them as they come in and make sure to ask them during the Q&A session. So you do not have to wait until the end uh, to type your questions. You can just uh, uh, type your questions as uh, you can uh, you, uh, you think about them. So without further ado, I would like to ask Sarah Kim to give her presentation. Sarah? Thank you, Chisoo. Um, I'll start by sharing my PowerPoint presentation. So after a lot of heartache, um, basically on June, Eighth, which is just um, last last week, the schools have been reopened in Korea for all kindergartners through high school, which I think Korea is one of the rare cases in the world where all the grades have opened so far. And basically this has put around 5.9 million students back to classes technically. However, we know that um, we are still in a trial and error process, so we'll have to see where it goes from now. So basically, the new school year in Korea start, was supposed to start on March 2, but then the pandemic struck and um, students faced around five postponements of the school year because we were trying to wait and see how things went. And basically, 
at one point, if you guys remember back in early March, we were the country with the second highest number of coronavirus cases in the world. And there was a lot of panic and concern. Um, eventually, we did try to um, contain the virus and flatten the curve. Currently, there are around 1,200 cases as of today and around 280 coronavirus deaths, which if you compare it to the scale of what's going on in the rest of the world, even discounting you know, the population differences, it's still um, considered contained. And so basically, we eased from quarantine measures to everyday life quarantine measures on May 6th. Um, that's when the education ministry announced that we will be reopening schools in later in May. And um, after a lot of trial and error, I think we're at the point where students are back in school. So how did we get there? Um, let's go from there. Okay, so starting with the new school with online classes, basically in April, we decided that um, the schools, the students can't just stay at home for, um, at that, that point we didn't know when they will be able to go back to the classes. So the remote class system or online class system began. And basically there was a three-step process where um, by each week, um, through three weeks, we had different grades come in and um, learn through remote classes. And at that point, kindergartners were still back um, asked to stay at home. And these online classes, I think, had three parts to them. Basically, the interactive classes through video conference between students and um, teachers, which we're all familiar with by now, like with Zoom classes or something equivalent to that. And then we had the pre-recorded lessons. Um, those were done by EBS, which is our education broadcaster and another education service. And then there are also online tasks for students to complete. And Basically, um, we went through a lot of trial and error process of there were unstable servers. Um, the younger kids got to kind of watch the EBS programs through online um, on TV. So that helped out a little bit. For students who had multiple um, siblings or they were not from lower income classes, we had the smart devices donated by Samsung Electronics and LG Electronics. Um, and basically our three major telecom basically made data free for these students. And if a country sh should be prepared for online learning, I think Korea has the infrastructure to do that. However, as we all been there, um, there are a lot of glitches, but basically I think it has to do with the quality of education. You know, students miss being with their peers, they're easily distracted. Um, you know, there are some technical glitches in the beginning, but that got worked through. And then high school seniors, you know what the education system is like here. They're so worried about being able to go to college, if they're going to be able to get their CSAT, which is um, similar to SATs in the United States. And, and the parents were just so tied up trying to get their kids, if they have multiple kids, through their school days. So that was a difficult time. And finally, on May 6th, we sort of eased into out of the official social distancing campaign into the everyday life um, quarantine. And the education ministry said that we will be returning back to school, physical campuses. And this was supposed to happen in a four step manner. And back then we had like coronavirus cases like in the teens. So things were looking good. And then if you guys remember, there was the um, case of its um, community transmission back related to the Itaewon clubs, which sort of kind of put the society aback. And there was a lot of concern because, you know, there was Hagwon instructors who were infected and then some students also got infected. So there were some worries, but what the education ministry did was push back the start date by one um, week or so. And that kind of led to um, teachers having a little more time to prepare and students also being um, high school seniors being able to return a week later than intended. And so basically, it was around 80 days after their school was supposed to start. Um, high school seniors, they were part one or phase one who got to return back to physical campuses. And you know, the first day didn't go in, um, all as planned because I think a couple hundred schools in the Incheon area were not able to move open or they basically began the school day and then they suddenly had to shut down because 
they were kind of scared about um, transmission of coronavirus. And basically um, what the concern was that there was an Incheon instructor who was infected and then who had a student got, who got infected who went to a um, karaoke bar and infected a friend. So this kind of kind of shows how community transmission can happen and also the importance of contact tracing and um, figuring and testing, of course. But regardless, the um, government decided to continue with the opening of schools. And basically, the second and the third batch of students all came back to school. And this was including the middle schoolers, the high schoolers, and even the kindergartners. And um, what the schools did was they implemented strict quarantine guidelines, I guess. And um, there are seven classroom guidelines, as you can see, which is basically, you know, check the health conditions, check the temperature, stay home if you're sick, open windows for ventilation, wear masks, um, wash hands for 30 seconds, and whatnot. And in a sense, this has been sort of effective in that when there was a case the student, the whole school would just shut down for that day and then re, um, revert back to remote lessons for, um, for however amount of time before um, it was deemed I was ready to open up again. And basically what we can see is that the school surrounding has changed a lot for the students. If you see in the um, photograph here, you can see that there are plastic, how should I say, like, um, barriers for the students. This is sort of an extreme case. Not all schools have this, but each student, each school can have their own kind of quarantine guidelines. The desks can be spaced apart, you know, they have their windows open, or sometimes they have seats empty in between the students. That really depends on each school. And um, I'll just get back into universities really briefly because Basically, I think university system is very similar to what's going on elsewhere in the world. Um, basically, the universities are, it's up to them to kind of decide what to do, what to do with opening up with the schools. And we've had similar cases where the students are kind of fed up with the having to pay full tuition when they're not going to classes, physical classes. And according to them, they're not getting the full quality education that they signed up for. Um, we had an unprecedented situation where Kungu University, just a couple days ago, they announced that they're gonna, um, they're planning to offer partial refunds to students. However, the education ministry today basically announced that they're not going to be enforcing um, refunds or government kind of funded refunds for the students. And they said the colleges are supposed to do what, whatever they're supposed to do. And then there's another issue, which is basically transmission, which comes through exams. And um, I know that in universities in the States, some of them are like smaller seminar style. Some of them are very large lecture style as well. And there is concern that if there is a lot of people like getting into one room that, you know, there can be transmission of um, the COVID-19. However, basically, this actually happened um, last month where there was test takers in Kacheng University. It was probably the first time they were doing on-campus tests for this class. And then there was somebody who got infected. And um, that led to extensive contact tracing and testing as well. And basically, the other issue was um, online um, ethics and cheating and concerns about what would happen if you can trust, if you can trust students or not through online exams. And we recently had a case a couple of weeks ago where med school students at Ina University cheated on mass. And um, what they did was they gathered into groups of, you know, two to nine and then using social media or even being in person, they took the test together or shared the answers. And then later on, the non-cheaters um, told the kind of told the school administration and then they caught on. And these students kind of faced disciplinary measures, which is basically getting zero and then kind of getting a slap on the wrist. Some people said that that was not enough of a punishment for students because they're future doctors, for example. However, at the same time, these students were kind of um, flung into this very unpredictable situation where they don't know what they're going to do and um, they didn't have enough time to prepare. And I think they kind of let the situation get the better of <laughs> their judgments. Um, this is just Yonsei University students today who are kind of demanding a tuition refund. And 
basically, we are facing a new normal where we don't know what's going to happen. Schools are ready in Korea basically to shut down at any moment and convert back to remote lessons because there can be a second wave of infections. We don't know what's going to happen in the fall. Even the summertime, I think it's going to be really hot. So keeping the quarantine measures is going to be very difficult. But at the same time, students are just very happy to be amongst their peers. And I think teachers are also happy to have their students back. However, teachers also are very tired because they have to prepare for um, in physical classes as well as the remote classes and be able to kind of um, switch back and forth between that. So I'll wrap things up here and um, get the floor back to Tisu. All right, thank you. Well, there are a lot of things that I could relate to, especially, you know, um, <laughs> you working at the higher education. Um, all right, now moving on to uh, Victoria. Well, if anybody has uh, joined us since the beginning, um, my name is Victoria Kim. I'm the sole correspondent for the LA Times. And I think there's been a, a bit of an evolution on the topic of this seminar, so I'm not going to be talking exactly on point about the reopening. Um, uh, it's uh, I'm going to be uh, more um, suggesting that we take a look back at what's happened so far and uh, do a review of um, some of the costs and pitfalls of uh, South Korea's um, coronavirus success story or what's been uh, deemed a coronavirus success story. Um, this image is uh, from a nightclub that I went to recently with uh, my very talented colleague photographer um, at a QR club registry outside a nightclub in Taejeon. So if anybody else is curious about that, I'm happy to um, talk more about that later. <laughs> but um, so just to, um, I would assume that most of you, unless you've been living under a rock, have heard of K-pop. Um, the South Korean government, uh, since K-pop success, has really tried to brand pretty much everything with a K-hyphen. Um, you may have heard of K-beauty, uh, K-fashion, even K-seafood. There's been an addition to that list lately, which has been what in Korean is called uh, K-panyok, loosely translated, means uh, K-disease prevention. Um, and South Korea has fared incredibly well, um, especially relatively and in hindsight um, in the pandemic and has been, um, that's been deservedly a, a source of immense pride both for the government and for the general public. Um, I've heard in news reports and in private conversation, including with my own father, um, that people feel like the country is uh, finally unquestionably in the camp of being an advanced or a developed nation, despite the fact that the rest of the world um, has long since viewed South Korea that way. Um, the hallmarks of that response came from its past experience with the MERS outbreak in 2015, um, based on which South Korea set up one of the most uh, thorough um, contact tracing regimes, scaled up testing at a rate that far outpaced other countries, um, and treated patients in hospitals well equipped with PPE and negative pressure wards. And all that has been extensively documented um, and publicized, including um, in the pages of the LA Times. So as we begin to talk about the next phase of this epidemic, I wanted to propose that we look instead at the flip side of that success. Um, some read into any critique of South Korea's coronavirus response as diminishing of that success, um, especially since the government is enthusiastically wanting to export what they really early on termed the Korean model of the disease response to countries around the world. But it, as much as with any other country, it's South Korea's first um, time in recent memory dealing with an epidemic of this scale and this level of uh, infectiousness. And Korea's disease response also hasn't been without its costs and its weaknesses. There are uh, definitely um, immense economic costs, but that's a question and a calculation for um, better minds than mine. So I wanted to talk instead about social costs borne by individuals and by the society, um, first among them being privacy. There's been a bit of a misconception that South Korea has a contact tracing app that's done away with all civil liberties and is constantly tracking everyone's movement at any given time. That is absolutely not the case. Um, what was central to the initial phases of South Korea's contact tracing was um, immediate blanket disclosures of the movements of people infected by the virus. Each of the patients was numbered um, both nationally and locally, and names weren't disclosed, but their gender, age, profession, city or area of residence and movements um, during whatever period was deemed relevant was disclosed. And this detailed information was obtained through shortcuts that were written into the law after the MERS outbreak um, for authorities to receive uh, cell tower data, CCTV footage and credit card usage without warrants. And this information was pushed out through um, smartphone push alerts and published online. 
Early on, people were reading these um, with rapt attention and resulting in speculation like you see in this article that um, one of the patients was a domi or a karaoke hostess or that two of the patients um, were having an affair. Um, initially, it was more idle online chatter than anything else, but the cost of this really snapped into focus with the Etoan Club cluster that Sarah also mentioned that took place in early May. Because of the, some, of the, some of the early clubs um, where, where cases emerged were LGBTQ clubs in a country where being queer is still not very widely accepted, it really drove home how a violation of someone's privacy could have real world consequences in employment and in family and personal relationships. A lot of people have asked how South Koreans have been so accepting of these measures, questioning whether it had to do with Confucianism or somehow a lesser degree of democracy. But truth is, it was probably um, more fear of the disease than anything else that drove the response. You had people clamoring for more information rather than less. Um, and since then, cities and other municipal governments have modulated the amount of information disclosed after um, concerns were raised, including by the National Human Rights Commission. But there has really yet to be a postmortem of um, what the public health rationale for each piece of information that was released, nor have we really heard from those who were infected and had to fight both the virus and a torrent of public anger. The disclosures gave people a flesh and blood target of blame rather than an invisible virus, um, and that included people like a follower of the cult like Shinshinji Church of Jesus or a presumably wealthy study abroad student um, from the Gangnam area vacationing in Jeju, or a young clubber who went dancing at several clubs over a long weekend. Um, and it may have been the disclosures that resulted in South Korea's uh, virus experience being experienced, it, it being shaped by a language of um, blame and stigmatization of the infected individuals. And um, no one image probably crystallizes that than this handwritten sign that was posted at an entryway um, to a, an apartment building in Incheon. It's from a fellow resident publicly shaming one of the infected club goers who lives in the building. And it says, um, I hope you're happy you got infected dancing at an Itaewon club like a delinquent. And it asks, uh, are you even human? Um, and that's resulted in people fearing the public shaming in some ways more than the virus itself. Um, a, survey, a survey by research at, researchers at Seoul National University found that um, South Koreans were, by a small margin, um, more concerned about the criticisms and blame they would get um, rather than being uh, infected themselves. But, um, it's a small margin, but it's still pretty telling. And this framing was noted by a professor who worked with and studied those living with HIV. And as uh, she said, um, blame and stigmatization makes the fight against the epidemic a matter of penalizing and shaming the infected individuals rather than casting them as fallible victims like anybody else deserving of protection. Um, and as we go into the long haul of living our lives while trying to put out uh, spot fires that will continue to emerge, shifting this language and culture will be key to setting the tone for uh, the response in the months to come. I wanted to also uh, raise a question of uh, societal fault lines um, exposed by the outbreak. And this is no means unique to South Korea. Any crisis has a, a way of revealing cracks that were already there. Um, in South Korea, the first clear revelation was in how certain vulnerable populations were being institutionalized. Um, the country's first death came from a locked psych ward. Um, it was a man who was, uh, who was 63 and weighed barely 90 pounds, and he had spent more than two decades in the locked psych ward where almost every single um, patient was infected during the outbreak. Doctors who later reviewed the conditions that these people had been living in uh, were pretty appalled and uh, said it, it, was, uh, it should not have been so. Um, and increasingly with some of the localized outbreaks that keep cropping up, it's become clear that, the, that a disproportionate amount um, of the risk in this epidemic was borne by uh, low wage workers who don't have the option of working from home or get paid at a level where not working or working fewer than two jobs is an option. Um, that's especially been true of delivery workers, the demand for whom has shot up um, with people staying home and taking advantage of South Korea's impressive um, e-commerce and delivery services. Um, one delivery worker collapsed and died on the job, and many others have been infected at outbreaks in distribution centers. Um, care workers who uh, serviced the in institutionalized vulnerable populations, many of whom are increasingly migrant laborers, have also been disproportionately infected. Foreign migrant workers, many of whom have taken the jobs in factories and farms unwanted by Koreans, have also largely been left out of the epidemic response or um, the ensuing economic rescue packages. So um, in, in the course of reporting on South Korea's coronavirus response over the past few months, 
every epidemic, every academic, every healthcare worker or government, government official I've spoken to has told me that um, South Korea's COVID-19 response is owed entirely to its uh, uh, failed in many ways and bumbling experience with the MERS outbreak, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome in 2015. Um, that took, disease took nearly three years to reach um, South Korea, and yet the country was caught flat-footed. And, and there are many examples in history of societies and countries failing to learn from past mistakes, so it is truly impressive how South Korea reviewed and revamped its uh, disease preparedness. Um, I think it's pretty apparent uh, to all of us that there will be the next epidemic, the next crisis, and the next disaster. So um, I think discussing what pitfalls um, this one had, could, can, and should inform South Korea and all of our responses to the next one. I'll wrap it up there. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I think uh, Victoria just touched upon very uh, important issues such as privacy and which is, you know, very much relevant here. We can, uh, I think, have uh, more discussions later about that. Um, all right. Now, uh, moving on to our discussions. Uh, Sumin? could go first. Yeah, I thought I, I found both presentations really fascinating. Like my mom and my family is in Korea right now. They all live in Seoul. And my mom is a teacher. So she's gone through a lot of the same procedures of like, I mean, and what they've done for her is that she teaches at the school. I mean, she gets the temperature checks, the health checks and whatnot. And everyone is working, and, but all the students are obviously tuning in remotely and she's complained to me about how like they won't pay attention <laughs> and they won't uh, focus on that so I really especially like that part of your presentation um, actually one question I had um, for either Sarah or Victoria is um, after looking through your presentations and whatnot is the um, obviously South Korea had elections recently and there were a lot of health precautions that um, government officials had to take. Um, you know, my brother talked about like, you know, masks at the polling places, temperature checks and whatnot. And considering we um, in America obviously have elections coming up in November and how the pandemic is affecting, um, how the pandemic is affecting potential polling issues is going to be a major storyline um, in the coming months. I'm wondering if you, if either of you can describe um, just how that election procedure went in Korea and if there are kind of any um, takeaways perhaps for the United States um, uh, as we prepare for our elections. Um, both Sarah and Victoria's uh, presentations were very illuminating. I'm based in Korea myself, so it was interesting to hear um, other journalists' perspectives on what's going on. I think you know, obviously the school season is not quite uh, started yet in the U.S., so this really can be a sneak preview uh, for Americans as they think about going back to school. And um, uh, one of the questions that I had from for Sarah, uh, Sarah's presentation dealt with, um, you know, uh, I think Vic said something about brush fires. We are seeing dozens of new cases emerge every day. Some of those have been affected um, at, and, and, and been found at school. So I'm, I'm curious, how the, you know, like in the States, we're thinking about the NBA or the MLB starting off, like what happens if a player on a team gets it? I wonder what the logic is like within the schools if they find infection from uh, a student or a teacher, uh, for that matter. On uh, Vic's, uh, you know, really thorough uh, take on sort of the ultimate cost of privacy, I, I'd be curious what her viewpoint is on whether this could work in the US. I think. Google and Apple have partnered up and uh, tried to uh, provide, I mean, they have the smartphones, they have all the data that is available in South Korea. Um, they're offering to slice and dice and offer up to states a uh, slightly different, uh, a different quality of it. It's more uh, anonymized uh, in the US and Korea, you basically uh, have a full, you can crack open the brains and see everything uh, where you've been, um, you know, who you've been in contact with. So uh, I, I'd be very curious. America is a much bigger country. Uh, they certainly have different expectations on privacy. And I was very curious sort of if she thought this could work in the US. Thank you, Tim. Well, actually, that's also the one question that I had, whether it would work here in the US. Right? I think it, many people would also um, have that question. So, all right, back to you, Sarah and Victoria. You could respond uh, to these. Uh, comments and questions. 
Um, I guess I'll start off with the election question. And basically for the April 11 elections, um, there was a lot of trepidation on whether this will work. It was scary because this is the first time people were kind of gathering in larger groups. And there first was a very high early um, voting rate, which I think happened about a week before. And then overseas voting happened a little bit before that also, but that really depended on the country. Some countries just didn't open up because of the pandemic going on there. And so on the actual day of the April 11th elections, general elections, there were a lot of strict measures in place. Um, you might have seen the photos of people standing one meter apart, wearing the mask, um, getting their hands sanitized, like the whole spiel. And Koreans are very well abiding about those things, I think. And, um, and I think elections polling ended around six o'clock and then people like symptoms or whatnot, they actually had an extra hour for suspicious people to also or infected people to vote as well that day, which I think is, um, you know, very, um, voting is a very fundamental part of democracy and a civic society where everyone can participate. So it worked out pretty well. I was very worried about what was going to happen, but even afterward, there were no um, um, any cases that were supposedly related to the voting turnouts. And we also have the highest voting, voting turnout in general elections and like, I forgot exactly how many, but more than a decade, I remember. So um, I think the situation was well managed and that I think people were determined to carry out their civic duty, which is voting, as well as carry out their other duty, which is public health and um, keeping with the guidelines to make sure that the transmission doesn't happen in the voting process. So. We'll have to see how things go in the United States because I know that people aren't wearing masks right now or not everywhere or the guidelines are kind of um, questionable. That's something that I might be interested in hearing from your side as well. And just quickly to the second question by Tim on the schools and what happens if there is a case within the school or within or amongst the teachers. So far, I don't think there have been any within school transmissions, but there definitely have been students or um, instructors, teachers who got infected outside of the school. And basically, I'll give you one example with the scare. On last, last weekend, there was a student, a high school student, right before um, school was supposed to open on Monday. She went to Lotte World, um, the amusement park, and was later tested positive. So there was a huge scare and basically the whole school didn't open the next day and a lot of people, because they went to school the previous weekend as well or previous week. So everybody got tested. What happens is that, you know, once the student is confirmed to have tested positive, I think the school informs the students and teachers right away. They report to the local education office because each district has their education offices as well or city. And the school shuts down, people are tested, and you know, if there aren't any other cases, in a couple of days they can resume the school when the school and health authorities determine it's okay. And in the meantime, um, as someone mentioned, remote classes would happen. So it's kind of a system where you can kind of go back and forth. Of course, we'll have to see if there are larger cases of transmissions within the school in the future. But so far, um, that's what's been going on. Um, just to add uh, to your point about the elections, um, I went to uh, a couple polling places and the, the lines were being kept, the um, hands, the um, plastic gloves were being worn and stuff like that. But I did go to a couple rallies um, before election day and those were a different question. I went to rallies for um, two of possibly the, the more popular candidates the, uh, with an impassioned uh, fan base. Um, who were holding rallies in, in the in the final lead up to the elections, and there was absolutely no social distancing. Um, and I think, as as a candidate, if um, if if a constituent is asking for selfies for or a handshake or a hug, that is a hard thing to um, to refuse. So there was a considerable amount of that going on as well, despite like all the um, uh, rules that were supposed to be followed uh, during campaigning. A lot of those, I think, uh, went by the wayside when it came to the moment of the rallies. Um, in terms of the question of whether um, some of this contact tracing can happen in the U.S., well, I, I think the long and short of it is, like, legally, it probably would not happen because South Korea went through 
um, a, a bunch of uh, new laws enacted after the MERS outbreak that allowed for authorities to obtain some of this information without a warrant. And if um, I, I would find it pretty hard to believe that such laws would be passed um, in, in the near future and without being met with like a host of legal challenges in the US, um, but also also culturally. That, um, the, the thing is like the, the contact tracing that happened in South Korea had two, two components. There was the tracing itself and then there was the disclosure that went along with the tracing, like who that information was made available to. And the latter bit, I think, was, was possibly more debatable in terms of what the epidemiological utility was in saying, like, does it really help to know that somebody was 24 as opposed to, like, 74 um, when you're trying to see if you came into contact with that person or you may have been exposed? Um, so I, I think there are a number of reasons it wouldn't happen in the U.S. Um, I, I think from a from a disease prevention standpoint, um, the tracing is helpful. The disclosure, I think, is a, is a different question. Does that answer all the questions? Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, uh, what's been just discussed here, I think there's a lot more to, um, you know, uh, discuss. I think we will, I mean, when we open up for discussion, I think would, you know there are a lot of important issues to um, touch. But for now, I think we'll get back to our discussions to ask for a second round of uh, comments or questions. All right, back to you, Sumin. Yeah, so I can actually um, talk a little bit about the situation here, especially because Sarah and Victoria both raised some perspectives, particularly on masks. And what we've seen in the United States is that obviously, unlike Asia, mask wearing is not part of the culture. So it's actually really remarkable to look back at the news coverage, perhaps in late February, early March, when the Surgeon General, Jerome Adams, who is you know one of the top medical officials uh, in the United States was wearing, don't, was saying to the public, don't wear masks. Like it is not gonna be helpful. And it would have been more helpful if the administration had said, you know, don't wear, you know, don't buy up or wear the N95 respirator mask because we needed to save them for healthcare professionals. But the message that the administration had given out at that point was that masks, you know, cloth or respirator or whatnot do nothing to stop the spread, which we know is not true. It does help a little bit. And that is, and the CDC and, you know, the health officials in the administration are encouraging the use of mask wearing now. But it's become such a cultural divide um, it, for the last several weeks. And, um, and it's primarily because the president of the United States chooses not to wear one. And he has said he doesn't want to wear one. He doesn't need to wear one. You know, people around him, he, I mean, he's tested regularly, if not daily. He is, um, you know, the, his, uh, and he just, has chosen not to wear one. Um, the staff in the West Wing did, some did wear masks for some time, um, but, uh, but now they've kind of ceased doing so. Um, and we're really gonna see that actually this week um, as the president resumes his campaign rallies. And this campaign rally is going to be, a, it is going to be a really interesting and somewhat kind of worrisome experiment about how to hold such big events in the middle of a pandemic. I mean, the president has our kind of moved on to this reopening phase of phase of the um, phase of the economy. He said in a Fox News interview last night that we are not closing down the country again, which is a kind of a pretty definitive statement when we don't know what's going to happen in the future. We don't know how badly the infections and the deaths will spike again. We don't know if there's going to be a second wave in the fall. I mean, just this week, Texas, Oklahoma, and California all recorded new highs in the number of cases in their countries. And Oklahoma, obviously, is very significant because that is where the president is holding his rally this coming Saturday in an indoor stadium with about 19,000 people. I've covered a lot of those rallies. There is absolutely no social distancing uh, in those places. Um, I will. I can. I can talk from internal newsroom discussions and, and and discussions with my fellow reporters on the beat that there is just concern about having to cover that rally. Um, so the Trump campaign has said, you know, we will we will distribute masks 
at the rally. Everyone will go through a temperature check. If anyone has, has a fever, they will not be able to enter. Um, everyone will be given hand sanitizer. But the funny thing is, even if they, um, you know, even if they're given masks, they're actually not going to be required to wear them inside the stadium, which um, is, which w would also kind of, um, it, it, it kind of goes along with the, what the administra administration has tried to say, you know, like we are recommending this, but we're not requiring it. Um, but obviously it's the president of the United States who sets the example for the rest of the country. Um, and he hasn't done that, which I think is partly why there's been this cultural divide over wearing masks or, wear, or not wearing masks. And the, and the interesting thing is that his wife, Melania Trump, the first lady, has actually done social media campaigns with her wearing a mask and encouraging uh, the public to cover their faces. And I was actually traveling with the president down to Florida um, la late last month for the space SpaceX launch, the first time when it failed, which was really sad when we make it to the roof of the <laughs> where we were going to launch the space launch and it was canceled 17 minutes before it was supposed to go. But um, his, all of his family members came, obviously, for the trip. And I just, as part of the White House traveling pool, I kept track of members of the administration members of the Trump family who were wearing masks, and it was actually only Ivanka. Like, Don Jr. did not, you know, Eric Trump did not, none of their spouses. Um, it was kind of funny, Jared Kushner, who is Ivanka's husband, put his mask on when he was around Ivanka, but not when he was around the president, <laughs> uh, which we noticed when he, he was getting on Air Force One and also when he was, um, when he was around the president. So just the dividing line, like I said, like the dividing line that we've seen over mask wearing has been just, you know, one storyline of hundreds, if not thousands of stories that we've seen come out of the pandemic here in the United States. Um, thanks for that comment. Uh, well, definitely you see a lot of uh, differences, um, well, cultural, but also in terms of guidelines and, you know, all that differences between South Korea and here in the U.S. right now. Um, uh, do you have any questions or? Um, sure, yeah. So I, the election discussion was really interesting. I'm going to more of the schools. Um, I was actually just curious, especially for younger kids, how you would handle, like, recesses and, like, playtime <laughs> because um i mean i don't have kids my husband and i don't have kids as of, uh, yet but um but i know that's a lot of that's some of the concern that my friends who do have school-aged children have discussed you know even when schools can reopen how do you i even though we know that children are less susceptible to contracting the coronavirus um you know how do you just keep kids apart you know you can do that in a classroom setting when they're seated at desks and there are plastic dividers but um, what do you do when it's just like recess or playtime? <laughs> All right. All right. That's a good question. And I think it's relevant to one of our um, audiences who've asked uh, that question. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Tim? Sure. I think um, I might use this opportunity to contrast the US and Korea in terms of some of these elements that we've been uh, talking about, uh, which are ingredients that go into the efficacy and the ability to reopen. So uh, we have this sort of uh, Q&A on our website, the, the WSJ website, that, that answers some of these basic questions. But the, the US is still struggling to ramp up its testing. It's months into the coronavirus being a pandemic and obviously US ranking number one in the world. And I think the, the latest statistics I saw that uh, for the US to hit its capacity, it needs about 6 million tests every week. They're at about half that. And uh, Korea, I think, from almost day one, was sort of uh, forcing everyone to get tested. I mean, now in the city of Seoul, any resident can be tested, uh, even if you don't show any symptoms. Um, I, I saw that the, the goal for the U.S. is 100,000 contact tracers, or that's the that's the suggested amount. Um, in Korea, obviously, you know, they've added some staff at the district level, but they seem to be quite ready to go from the beginning. Um, and contact tracing played such a central role in, in South Korea's response um, uh, in, in able to identify where the disease was and where it might be traveling. And 
you know, I from talking to my relatives in the U.S. and my friends there, it was really interesting the scarcity of supply at the very beginning. Uh, people had to make their own hand sanitizer. Uh, certainly, we've seen any number of homemade face masks um, that they were impossible to find. I remember several uh, Korean friends of mine in the states asking for me to send them <laughs> supplies <laughs> through the mail if it were possible. So it, it was really this sort of scarcity in the U.S. is they really had a a, a far larger magnitude problem than we did here in Korea. Um, and then lastly, I, you know, we're starting to see some some shifts in this at the, the state and even federal level somewhat. But this idea of what do you do with someone who's confirmed, who's a confirmed case of the coronavirus. Um, in Korea, almost immediately, you were, uh, if you were a mild case, you were sent to, in effect, like a government-run facility. They were sort of unused dormitories at colleges, uh, some of them were for uh, worker dormitories or training. So there was like some LG and Samsung, uh, you know, uh, facilities put in use, uh, which they generously offered to the government uh, at no uh, <laughs> at no rental cost. And it's interesting. In, in some of the, the journals covered recently, um, this this guy, Tom Frieden, who had been the, the former head of the CDC, he's now running his own um, nonprofit public health initiative. But his goals... And this, this story ran, I think, just a few days ago. His goals sounded very much like the playbook for South Korea, which they were to uh, widespread testing, contract tracing, and isolation of people who are infected or exposed. So uh, I'll close here. I didn't want to make it a victory lap for South Korea, per se. But South Korea, I, I, you know, they, they did have the mayor's incident five years ago. I think the 2020 coronavirus will probably be the, the thing the U.S. officials look back to. The next time there is a epidemic or a pandemic, uh, but South Korea did catch a lucky break, um, and I think we should bring it up because they were a early adopter, if you will, of the virus. Um, all these other countries, I think, within just a couple of weeks, I think more than 80 countries had slapped travel restrictions on Koreans either going or uh, there or the people uh, traveling to Korea. Uh, it's now uh, well over 100, uh, but this was a a lucky break for Korea because as the disease was migrating around the world from from Europe to the U.S., it's now in Latin America. Koreans couldn't go there. Foreigners couldn't come into Korea, and this was sort of like an indirect or an unintentional uh, inoculation of the population. Um, so uh, yeah, I think we can see some of the sort of structural stuff that was put in place that allowed South Korea to flatten its curve. I think the U.S. will certainly take uh, the painful lessons of today. Uh, for the future. Uh, in terms of my question, I wanted to uh, I wanted to ask Vic if she could expand a bit more on. Uh, we have this contact tracing, and she made the the smart point. It's not an app. It's sort of like an apparatus, if you will. I wondered if if she had ever given any thought to the uh, societal effect this might have on uh, promoting social distancing. She she threw up this. Uh, wonderful research that said people are more afraid to uh, be shamed about the disease than actually getting sick uh, themselves. And I just wondered, you know, I, I live in Seoul. Uh, I know that if I were to contract the disease, every single social interaction in every, uh, you know, bar, uh, restaurant, uh, not a page on club, but anywhere I've been might be exposed to the public. So I wondered if, if she would uh, assign any value to ongoing adherence to social distancing and distancing in South Korea uh, to the quite invasive uh, contact tracing. Uh, thank you, Tim. Um, I can say that, you know, I'm one of those people who made my own hand sanitizer at home. <laughs> <laughs> Find it. <laughs> um, all right. Okay, back to you, Sarah and Victoria. Well, I can actually, I can also speak a little bit to to uh, what's happening in the schools. Um, not so much for younger kids, because I went to a uh, girls' high school on the first day that um, high school was opened. It was it, schools opened um, first for high school seniors in South Korea because they have to get into college, which is all important in South Korea. Um, and I spent the day there. And even for these, you know, uh, nearly adults, the old, oldest students in the K through 12 system. Um, it was distancing was was hard um, and these were kids who had not seen their friends in about five months they, it, um, it was a high school in Tegu, which was the center of the outbreak 
in South Korea. So um, all of them had been on lockdown for months and hadn't seen their friends in a really long time. Um, and, and there was hugging, there was hand holding, there was a lot of like excited squeals and, and jumping yeah. around uh, <laughs> with, with arms linked together. And there were teachers in the hallways saying like, you know, get apart, like don't touch each other. <laughs> and it, I think it was tough for the teachers to do, but it was also pretty clear that as the days went on, like this was the very first day, that it was going to continue to get harder and harder. So if the oldest students are like that, I can only imagine what it would be like for the youngest of kids. Um, so I, th I think that's just natural. They were uh, trying a bunch of things, including the plastic barriers. It was mostly reliant on um, students trying to enforce themselves and uh, teachers trying to kind of patrol the hallways and try to tell the students to stand apart. There were some um, uh, tape markings on the floor, like for example, during PE, they, they had taped um, uh, regularly spaced out uh, um, it, intervals on, on the gym floor so that students would uh, stand in that distance. And then uh, they were trying to, you know, because they had to do things like um, do jumping jacks wearing masks. So I, I think the teacher had, had them not doing very much, but this is all also going to continue to get harder as, as the summer goes on. And it looks like we're in for a, a hot summer in, in Seoul this season. Um, in terms of what you were saying, Tim, about the, um, the inadvertent effects of this these disclosures i'm certainly feeling it myself as much as you have that that it is sort of it you know it also um by the fact that uh, some of the information disclosed has include included um uh in in limited cases last names and um you know like uh uh nationalities so you know um in, in, for a lot of South Koreans, it's pretty anonymous to be a, a Kim who is a South Korean national. If you were a Martin and an American national, that would be a different question. <laughs> so I don't I, go outside. I, I know that I would be, I would be found out immediately. <laughs> um, and and there is that inadvertent effect, and uh, you know that could certainly be chalked up to a positive. There could certainly be an argument made that that is not really. Um, a, a worthy way of enforcing um, this type of uh, social distancing, that, that the cost of um, the chilling impact it overrides the benefits of it, but there, there could be arguments made in both directions, um, as far as I can see. I guess to expand on how social distancing is happening in school and also for the younger kids, if there are resources and what happens, um, Around 10 years ago, I actually taught English to kindergartners and elementary students. So I know that it's impossible to keep younger kids apart. <laughs> <laughs> and back then, we had the um, foot and mouth disease. I think that was what was going on when I was teaching. And then, you know, we got these kids to wash their hands every break. But kids, they drool everywhere. They touch each other. <laughs> we enforce the rules. But I mean, they know what they're supposed to do, but everything else that they do in between, um, mm -hmm. it's very hard to monitor kids. And um, Victoria touched upon it, right? There are all the measures in place, you know, depending on the school, sometimes you have the plastic partitions. For example, the only time you're supposed to take off your mask are when you're eating, so that's lunchtime. And some cafeterias, they say like only, you know, sit every student apart. Um, some have the partitions, but the reality is, kids will be kids they don't have the same kind of dangers in mind and they will stick to each other and teachers i know i've spoken to some they just like lament that there is nothing that they can do to make kids listen <laughs> and that's just the case um i think even in non-pandemic times but i mean i think um even the younger kids are aware that there is something going on and they are aware of what they're supposed to do however are we going to be able to keep up with the stringent um, social distancing measures in classrooms? That's probably going to be very, very difficult. That's why the other measures in place that you know Tim kind of asked about as well. If there is a, you know, I hope there isn't, but if there are transmissions within the school, um, can early measures be taken to kind of contact trace and lock that down and then make sure that um, whoever is affected are quarantined? Basically, our education minister, Yune, um, in May, when she announced the reopening of school, said that if we don't open now, you know, we don't know when we're going to be able to reopen the semester again. So that was kind of taking the risks and balances of, you know, the quality, 
having education for kids versus, you know, safety and health. And I think it's kind of a trade off with each other. Um, I think it's a risk that parents, teachers, and students are willing to take for the sake of education. However, we'll have to continue and see if there are more, not more community transition transmissions going on. And also, I think there is also a system where not all schools have to shut down, you know, depending on the location. Um, if there was, for example, the cases at Intan, it was the Mitchell Ward and that just shut down and, you know, some of the surrounding districts. So I don't think kids are able to social distance. Um, what can we do to kind of minimize the impact if there are cases in the future? I think that's what we have to look into. I've been joking that um, there's been no better time in Korean history to be the loner kid at school. Because <laughs> oh, <laughs> everyone else is put apart. <laughs> Introverts thrive in the coronavirus pandemic. But, For sure. Um, I think Vic left, let out, uh, forgot the most important detail from her visit to the high school, which is uh, she was confused for a student. <laughs> Very happy. It's been a long time since high school. <laughs> well, um, all right. Thank you so much. So, um, well, I would like to mention to our, uh, remind our audience that uh, you can address your questions um, on our chat box. Uh, we currently have just one question, but you can, uh, please, if you have any questions, uh, please um, write them in the chat box and I'll make sure to uh, ask them to our uh, participants. All right, uh, I'll, I'll, um, this uh, one question that we have is, uh, it's, it's not what we've touched upon right now, it's kind of, uh, but maybe if you could you know, explain more in detail. So the question was about how is, social distancing being done inside uh, schools and universities. So I guess we just talked about how, you know, um, kids can do social distancing at school, but maybe we could sort of, you know, broaden that category to, you know, um, bigger, like, uh, you know, um, yeah, bigger kids, like in the high school or even in the uh, universities, how students can do social distancing. So for example, in school, uh, in classrooms. So this is also uh, actually, you know, one of my concerns because we'll be going back to campus uh, this fall and how are we really gonna do social distancing? And, you know, what are some of the measures that South Korea is, is taking? So for example, if you are to enter a classroom, do you take temperatures and do you make sure that you wear a mask and do you, you know, um, wash your hands before or, you know, uh, use hand sanitizer before entering the classroom. So what are some of the, you know, more detailed measures that uh, the schools or universities are taking right now? Um, I'll get started. Actually, I didn't get to touch upon it in that much detail in my earlier presentation. So I'm glad to have this chance. And basically, um, schools are advised not to have all um, student, the student body in session at the same time. So um, that might be something that might be happening at the university level as well. So students don't are divided up into having the in-person classes and remote classes. So not everybody is in at school at the same time. And if the school allows it to have less people in each class, that's another kind of um, measure that's being taken. As to the everyday process, I mean, depending on the school, I think it depends on the resources that each school has, some school has everything in place imaginable, and then there are schools that probably don't have the finances or the resources to do everything. But something that can be common is, you know, temperature checks or the thermal screen checks that you see in a lot of office buildings and um, buildings in general in Korea at the moment. And then there's the mask wearing, as we mentioned, and in the warmer weathers, I think there was a lot of worry about the K N ninety four. that's the thick ones that's, um, anti-pollutant proof. There are worries that it's going to be too hot and suffocating, so our government basically said yeah, they're going to produce the um, thinner, more, I don't know, breathable masks, I guess, for the summertime. And that went into sale last week as a part of our public um, mask system where we can purchase up to three. Now we can purchase up to 10 masks per person starting from today. But that's in place. And uh, within universities, the older students, that was as part of the question as well. And I know that not all schools have gone back to campus. Some schools have 
has minimal, you know, those, you know, for example, med schools or whatnot, where physical classes are necessary, they've had smaller sessions. Some cases with testing, those, I mean, exam taking, those who can't take it remotely, they've had um, in-person testing as well. And so far, I think it's been working, but we'll have to see, I think, what the school, the universities decide, because it's up to them right now to decide if they're going to completely reopen or not. Um, currently, there are a lot of worries with the university students because they're a lot more mobile than the um, lower grades, the first to 12th graders, because that is sort of a control setting where there's the, uh, teachers and authority and whatnot. With universities, it's a lot more flexible about um, with students coming in and out and they travel or they come from different sections and different districts and whatnot. So there's a lot of worries how universities will be able to contain the virus. Just to add, add to that a little bit, I, less so for schools, because I'm not really familiar with, um, except for this one school that I visited for a story, what's going on uh, in the universities or uh, in schools. But generally in South Korea, there was never the type of lockdown that occurred in the US. There, there were never um, blanket restaurant closures or uh, blanket like uh, bar closures. So. Um, restaurants I don't have the spacing out that some of the uh, place, restaurants as they reopen in different communities in the U.S. are having. So restaurants have been packed, bars have been packed, subways have been packed. And I think it's largely, it is, um, except in institutions where it's enforced, like in schools, it is going to be up to the individual um, to, to remain vigilant. And I think uh, we really felt the um, relaxation in Seoul when the, uh, when the number really dipped to, I think it was like under five at some point of daily infections. And it really seemed like we were close to the finish line. And then, and then, um, and then it really uh, sort of unraveled from there. So I think it's, it is up to the individuals and uh, it hasn't really um, been as foolproof as it may seem from, from the outside. I can answer the sports question, um, but basically Baseball was the first to start reopening, and we've been. I heard that it's been televised in the states as well. However, um, sports have resumed their games. Basically, they're doing it in stadiums without audience or spectators, pretty much. Um, Victoria mentioned earlier that we never went into full lockdown mode, um, as compared to some other countries. We were never in prison. Um, people were never in prison. Sorry, <laughs> I don't know if that's the right word, but. Um, I found out for the first time that journalists were essential workers, actually, this time around. However, so things are done differently in that, you know, people wear masks, they follow the social norms and regulations, and they have been continuing on um, with their daily lives, even at the peak of the pandemic in Korea, I think, which is late March. Um, so... I'll transition on to the second question about teleworking at home how, and how that's going to affect the future of um, office life in Korea. Uh, I've spoken to a lot of my um, friends who have been teleworking at home, but that's kind of a privilege, as um, Victoria mentioned earlier in her presentation. Those who have such um, full-time jobs where they can telework, that's a privilege, whereas opposed to the... Um, part-time workers or non-regular workers, we call them in Korea, who don't have the full contract. They are the ones who are out there who have to um, be at the front lines of everything in terms of delivery, um, in terms of mo wrestling multiple jobs. So Korean office workers were less impacted, I would say. And then even retailers and shops, I haven't seen none of them really closed down during the peak of that pandemic either. So um, we'll kind of have to see how things go from there. Mm -hmm. um, just to uh, piggyback off uh, what you said about baseball, just because I, I went to uh, opening day games um, in South Korea, I'm, I'm doing, I'm full of, I'm sort of fulfilling everybody else's wishes as they, they're stuck at home in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> uh, opening day of baseball here. And uh, they were also supposed to do things like, um, the players couldn't high five each other. 
nobody was allowed to spit, which is a big deal in baseball um, because of chewing tobacco. So there were, there were practices like that. And they were saying at the time that they would um, phase fans in fairly soon because um, anybody who knows uh, South Korean baseball knows that the fandom and the insane cheering and, and rituals of, of baseball fandom is a big part of games here. But that still hasn't happened, and that largely has to do with the recropping up of cases after what seemed like an, a near end. Um, in terms of um, offices, another thing that I will mention that happened that happened here that I don't think has happen been happening in the U.S. And, and and that is because most offices in the U.S. I would presume have been shut down. Here, for example, if there's been one case in a giant office building of, say, a branch of LG, they've closed down the entire building to disinfect the entire building. And that's, I would imagine, is a very costly process. Um, I think the, the um, finances of that will probably be tallied up at, at a later date, but they, they have been making those kinds of extraordinary measures of, like, if there's been one, per, one case, and then they would shut down the entire building. Um, as, and tried to get pretty much everybody tested and all the floors and surfaces sanitized. Whether uh, we'll be able to do that here in the U.S. Because, um, I mean, so far, you know, I mean, we've been all working home, teleworking. Uh, and I, when we, once, you know, we return back uh, to workspace, I wonder, you know, how it will take place. Um, so there's one question about uh, whether senior teachers and professors uh, are returning back to work. So for example, like in our university, um, there's this uh, guideline that if you're over 65 or if you have underlying conditions, you can apply and you can uh, but you can uh, basically teach on 100% uh, teach online in the fall without coming back to campus. So is there any uh, measures like that in South Korea uh, at universities or in you know, high schools or at just public schools in general for elderly? Um, I'm afraid I haven't heard of such measures going on. And um, as mentioned earlier, basically we never completely shut down. So I know that professors, that I've spoken to an interview, they're always in their offices when I call them up for like quotes and whatnot. And it seems like they've just continued with the work. And that's also goes into the question of, you know, how students have been demanding for refunds of their tuitions, because they're saying they're not getting their the full quality of lessons, but they've been doing remote classes. Well, the professors and the school faculty basically have been saying they've been doing the work. And in fact, what's being saved in terms of, you know, tuitions, it's not really, or, kind of fees. It's not being saved because there's extra work going on into producing those remote classes. Not all elderly professors are technically savvy, though. Um, a lot of them are, I guess. So basically what they're saying is that though the school's not opening, the faculty is still running and operating and doing all the work. So it doesn't make logical sense for them to refund the students because um, school's still happening. And also this Korean school year happens, um, starts in the springtime for well, I think everyone here is Korean, so they might know that, but just for reference. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, great, thank you. Uh, so I have, a, um, uh, I, I have one question that I would like to ask related to privacy issue. Um, so, it, it, um, so he, well, some experts actually here in the U.S. stated that, you know, Korea was not a free country like the U.S. And so, you know, this, uh, that's why it's possible for, you know, to do digital surveillance and, you know, like the um, contact tracing, uh, which is also happening in, you know, uh, many other places uh, in Asia. Uh, but I, I don't know whether you agree with that, but uh, that, you know, South Korea is less democratic. Uh, but uh, I think what my, one, what my question is, we obviously know there are a lot of you know issues when it comes to privacy, right? And doing this um, contact tracing, obviously they conflict. And but in order to you know really um, contain the virus, this may be a necessary uh, step to do necessary measures uh, to take. Uh, the qu my question is, what is South Korea? I know they face a lot of. Uh, problems with this as you know Victoria went through in her presentation so what are some of the uh, what South Korean government trying to do to overcome these problems that emerged as they're doing this contact tracing 
So it, it's been an evolving process here as much as anywhere else. And as I mentioned, like there is there is the um, contact tracing bit where they track down everybody who's been in contact. And then there's the disclosure bit where they um, sort of push the information out to the public in terms of like where an infected person has been in the past two weeks or so when they may have been potentially infectious. Um, and in terms of the disclosure, uh, South Korea has very much sort of modulated the information that it discloses. Initially, it sort of depended on which uh, district within Seoul or which small city was doing it. It kind of was all over the place. And in some instances, like people knew which apartment complex it was. Um, and it, in, in some cities gave out last names, other, many others didn't. Um, and it would be, you know, sometimes it would be to the level of like bus number nine between like 11.09 a.m. and 11.13 a.m. between these stops. And in some instances, it, it would be, um, you know, like the name of a restaurant or stuff like that. And a lot of that has really been sort of wound back. Um, a lot of the uh, disclosures now are, are um, only what is deemed to be relevant. And that is that is sort of a, it is a very uh, a subjective um measure that uh, that is going to be applied to individual in each individual case and also these um this information about uh the movements of the infected people are now being deleted after two weeks like that doesn't prevent anybody from saving it and then um continuing to hold on to it for their private purposes but in in the official websites of the municipalities they they are um taken down after two weeks so they have been, authorities here have been very cognizant of that problem and are trying to um, be sensitive to potential problems that may arise. Um, in terms of uh, the CCTV and surveillance, I think that's a completely different question. Some of it might be a, a cultural difference. I, ever since this um, outbreak, I have certainly noticed many more CCTVs at various corners, like a, a park that, um, that I grew up near that I've been going to since I was in elementary school, I all of a sudden re uh, realized there's a giant CCTV that says multi-purpose CCTV. It's not there for any other reason than, well, it's there for apparently an indeterminate purpose of whoever sees, um, sees fit. Um, and that's probably, I don't know enough about the sort of the thought process behind the installation of those CCTVs, but there is certainly a, a much more of a, um, acceptance to, to that type of uh, footage. And I haven't heard as much of a backlash as I would anticipate in communities in the US to that. And, and the CCTV footage has been a part of um, the coronavirus contact tracing. And I'm, I'm sure if stuff like that had happened in the US, it would also be met with some resistance and some lawsuits potentially. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, well, I would like to ask, since we are uh, almost at, uh, running out of time, uh, I would like to ask our participants um, and all speakers, also as well as discussants, Hoongin and Tim, if you have any final comments to make in terms of how maybe if you could uh, perhaps, you know, uh, talk about how uh, U.S. could uh, learn from South Korea's case or what are some of the challenges that's lying ahead of us here as we are trying to reopen? Um, um, I, I mean, I, time and time again, covering the coronavirus debate unfold over the last several weeks, particularly on Capitol Hill, I have heard repeatedly from senators questioning administration officials, why can't we be like South Korea? South Korea didn't X. South Korea did the, uh, why are we not implementing similar procedures here? And I think we, this discussion has done a great job of outlining why a lot of, why there would be certain difficulties to, you know, literally export policies and procedures of what South Korea did to here, um, including the privacy issues and whatnot. But I think some kind of takeaways that we are going to be watching here in the United States is definitely just how, you know, because South Korea has been so ahead of us, just how you guys handle reopening of schools, the economy, or, or reopening of schools, you know, how do you handle how the virus acts in the heat and the different behavior that people have in the summertime, and because we're kind of heading into that phase now. Um, my concern, though, and and I don't know what kind of the attitude is like in, in South Korea. Maybe and there maybe there isn't a direct parallel because, as you said, there wasn't this dramatic lockdown of the economy as there was here in the United States. But um, the the focus 
um, really, you know, led by the president himself, the focus in the United States really has turned to reopening of the economy. And they're just kind of trying to leave the pandemic kind of behind in history, even though we know that, you know, there could be a potential second wave in the fall, that health officials are still trying to sound the alarm. And yet the government are, you know, our senior leaders in government are really trying to return to that sense of normalcy. Um, there isn't, and a lot of it is also external factors. Obviously, we've had um, weeks of very, uh, you know, serious um, debate and concerns and unrest about race after the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis, and that's consumed a lot of the news coverage and the focus of our policymakers in the White House. But um, but we'll all, we'll be taking. But it is actually kind of dramatic how much focus has shifted away, you know, on Capitol Hill, for, for example, um, you know, there was so much, you, you know, Congress passed a $2 trillion package in a matter of days, which is just unheard of, in, of, a, of a, you know, of an economic package and a rescue package that large. And, you know, it's only, a, you know, a couple of months later after that, the unemployment rate is still in the double digits. You had another 1.5 million people file for unemployment claims last week according to the numbers that were released this morning but now what uh capitol hill is not talking at all about um a second you know like multiple rescue packages even though economists from the right and left have said that's going to be a necessary thing in the coming weeks um so i think we'll be so i think the concern to watch here is just how much the attention and the focus from policymakers shifts away from, you know, dealing with the results of the pandemic, because it's still very much alive, it is still very much serious. Um, and I know that we will be very closely watching how, um, how South Korea handles the certain uh, phases of certain phases of the pandemic, um, as we've been watching um, already so far. All right. um, anybody else? Just we are out of time, but maybe briefly. Um, just briefly, I, I remember having a conversation really early on when South Korea was in the thick of things with an uh, epidemiologist in the U.S. Um, and, and, you know, the numbers were, it seemed at least at the time, were pretty low in the U.S. And I remember him telling me that he was really concerned about the disparate responses that were going to happen in each state. And South Korea has the advantages of being a small country and a very centralized country and its, its government response. Um, and it, it was interesting to see what he, his concerns playing out just in a matter of weeks. So that is something that probably can't be taken from South Korea because that's just the way the American system is. But and, and it's it's um, you know uh, over here as well. I think in South Korea, people have been also been watching with interest and concern the unfolding of things in the U.S. Thank you, sir. Um, I just wanted to briefly answer some of the questions. First one about public sports events. We had a Kia Women's Open today, right there. And I think we had the KPLG um, game earlier um, last month. Second question was about how are you going to fund all the quarantine facilities and whatnot? I'm sure we're going to be seeing some tax increments in the future. And lastly, um, what sort of model there will be for pandemic outbreaks? I think what we have is the K quarantine process, but I think that's a just catchy name. It can be applied everywhere, basically. Extensive testing, isolation, contact tracing, and then also public transparency um, and public cooperation. I think that's a good model to follow for any country in the world, regardless of where you're located. Well, thank you so much for your insightful views and fruitful discussions. Well, um, I just want announcement for uh, our Jewish event next week. So we'll have another virtual event focusing on the U.S. ROK cooperation in the COVID-19 era with uh, journalists. And so hope many of you can join us uh, once again. And well, I would like to thank again our presenters, discussants, and audience both here in South Korea, and especially for those of you in South Korea for staying up so late. Um, and uh, well, uh, have a great day for those uh, of you here in the US, but good night to those of you in Seoul. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much, and uh, we hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. <laughs>